this particular session is about rethinking because somebody has thought about it before and I'm specifically assigned for a few minutes to talk about strengthening judicial systems in Africa an imperative for good governance, sustainable peace and security under the theme of fostering good governance for peace and security in Africa. I've written a detailed paper which will be circulated to the students and what I'll do is simply to tease out a few things in the hope that during the interaction we'll then get into the meat of what we ought to be discussing. Before I make my comments on the subject of the judiciary, I want to raise a few things. Number one, there is the tendency when we talk about Africa to talk about her as if she was homogeneous, that there is something called about Africa and there is one size fits all ideas about her. Not true. Number two, there is the assumption that when we talk about peace, security, and justice, we have one meaning for it. And I invite you to ask yourself the question, if this subject which is preoccupying us today was to be rendered in Kenya Rwanda, would it still mean the same thing? Would peace, which I believe is a Mahoro, would it mean the same thing? Would security mean the same thing? Would justice mean the same thing? In other words, I'm telling us that all of us in this room are handicapped. We are handicapped because our thought processes are influenced by how we were trained. If you are trained in an English system, by default you think like that. If you are trained by the Belgians or by the French, you think like that. So that when we talk democracy, is as conceived and articulated by the West. So you'll see many of us, we think we are at our eloquent best when we are citing sources from England, France, and Portugal. Number three, when we talk about rethinking all these things in the context of Africa, we have to remind ourselves that African countries are playing in an environment in which we have very little control. I'm happy that this particular conference is not sponsored by GIZ or USID <laughs> or one of those organizations. Because typically in every other African symposia or this you'll find sponsored by GIZ, UK aid, and all those things. There is no free lunch. When they sponsor these activities, they have an agenda that they want to achieve. And the sooner we smell that coffee, the safer we are. The last thing that I want you to apply your mind to are five things that I've watched in Africa in the recent past. One, the day before yesterday, the president of Mozambique thanked the Italian government for training their forces to fight against insurgency in northern Mozambique. The president of Mozambique thanking the Italian government. I want you to remember that. <laughs> Number two. In the recent past, we have had the meeting called Chogam here in Rwanda. If you look at this particular meeting, this Chogam, this Chogam was founded by the British long before any of the African countries became independent. It claims that it is an organization of free and equal countries, but it is not lost on me that the permanent head must be the British monarch. Number two, I want you to remember that. 
the French also have their own organization for former French, for French-speaking countries. And you Rwandese belong to it. <laughs> the Portuguese also have their own. And you also remember that we are defined as Francophone, Anglophone, and Lusophone, and very soon Arabophone, and Sinophone. Number three, two weeks ago at the Confucius Center at the University of Nairobi, there was a competition where young Kenyan graduates drawn from different areas were competing as to who would speak the best Mandarin. And they were praised that they have done very well. And the Chinese were there saying, this opens opportunities for you. Lastly, the day before yesterday, there was a raid in one of the prisons in Nigeria. And as I speak to you now, 300 prisoners are on the run. That is Africa, the Africa where we want peace, the Africa where we are talking governance, the Africa where we are talking security. And very lastly, then I go to the judiciary. The pride of a military officer in Africa when they are colonized by the British is to say that I was trained at the Sandhurst and when they say so they are very proud. <laughs> I say all this because the problem about security in Africa is here. This is our problem in Africa. So it is true that we must strengthen our judicial systems because these judicial systems are the ones that will help us in dispute resolution. But I remember my friend Charles is here and Freddie is here and even my very good friend General Limwengu is here, a lawyer. You will remember in 1966, I think, a Ugandan called Picho Ali said, when he was asked, do you believe in this thing called independence of the judiciary? He said he did not. One year later, Dan Wadada Nabudere, who is a Ugandan, said, after all he said and done, I agree with Picho, that there is nothing like independence of the judiciary, that the so-called independence of the judiciary is nothing but division of labor. There is merit in that statement. Because when we talk about judiciary as playing a critical part in ensuring peace and good governance, it sounds very good. But ladies and gentlemen who are here present, let us look at our continent, the continent of Africa. And for the students here, I invite you to read a book called The Curse of Berlin, Africa After the Cold War by Adebajo Adekeye, The Curse of Berlin. The oldest African country post-colonial is Ghana, slightly over 62 years. And the African nation is very young, the post-colonial African nation. And the post-colonial African nation is still in many ways governing herself on the basis of inherited institutions, including the judiciary. The way we are trained, if you are colonized by the British, they'll tell you the common law system where General Ulimwengo and I the kind of training that we got. And we are at our best and at our proudest when we are talking about a judge in England called Denning. Here in Musanze, you don't know Denning. <laughs> when we are talking about the reasonable man, even today in our courts, even in Tanzania, they say the reasonable man is the man in the Clapham omnibus. Not the border border rider in Musanze. That is the judiciary. That is the jurisprudence that we are talking about. 
That is the jurisprudence that is supposed to guarantee peace and sustainable development. When we are talking about conflicts that are generated through land tenure systems in Uganda, whether it's the Miro system or the leasehold, and you go to the high court in Uganda, you will have a jurisprudence that is alien to us. That is the common law. When you go to South Africa, the new constitution notwithstanding, it is largely Dutch Roman law. It's, remember, Dutch Roman, not African, not Kosa Zulu, Dutch Roman law. When you go to the French system, it's the civil law. So the judiciaries that are, you are asking me to talk about as being strengthened are alien systems. And how many people in Africa consume the justice that is meted out here in Rwanda? If you look at the population that consumes the services that are rendered by the judiciary, or in Gambia, or in Cameroon, what is the percentage of the population? How are other disputes resolved? I'm saying all these things in order to raise in your mind certain annoying and nagging questions about who we are and about the institutions that we have. John Henry Clark, whom you must know if you did not know him, a famous African-American pan-Africanist said that when African countries regained independence, all of them, without exception, inherited systems of government which mimicked the governance systems of the countries that colonized them. And he proceeds to say that no African country will ever succeed by mimicking those systems. And I agree. Today, Look at the state of Africa. Remember, we are talking about peace, security, and sustainable development. Look at Africa, and I'll take you through just very quickly. And conflict may be defined in different ways. Mozambique, North, conflict, active. Somalia. Not so active now, but there are conflicts. Ethiopia, conflict. South Sudan, conf conflict. Sudan, conflict. Eastern Congo, conflict. Central African Republic, conflict. Niger, conflict. Burkina Faso, conflict. Mali, conflict. Cameroon, conflict. Do I go on? I shouldn't. These are the ones that we report. This is the Africa that we are talking about, about whom, about which we are saying there will be peace, security, and sustainable development, and that the judiciary has a role in it. And we must not forget that there is a nexus between policing and the judiciary on a daily basis. The question, therefore, is, Is strengthening the judiciary in and of itself the route to peace, security, and sustainable development? Of course not. The judiciary is only one of the, uh, the, the foots or the, 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 the stands of the tripod, if you may. So, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about institutions, we've got to ask ourselves whether Africa has a reason to examine her governance systems, and I dare say so. I had my very good friend, doctor, talking about the African peer review mechanism. Africa has no shortage of initiatives. No shortage. No shortage. Which good, are good on paper. But do they change Africa? Today, if judges are to be trained, You'll hear being, them being trained in the United Kingdom to come and adjudicate over election disputes, African election disputes. 
non-tenure systems, human rights, the law principles. This is how we train our people. Is it necessary to strengthen the judiciary? No doubt. I'm not disputing that you need to strengthen the judiciary. But on the basis of which kind of jurisprudence? When the colonizers came here, they told us a number of things, particularly us who have gone to school, and we are the most dangerous people to Africa. They told us a number of things. They, first of all, they told us that some of our laws are repugnant to justice and morality. We are talking about justice. Whose justice were they talking about? Some of you who are lawyers here, one of the things that I always remind them about how our judiciaries are trained is this. If you look at our penal codes, there is an offense called sex against the order of nature. How many of you have read it? Sex against the order of nature in some places is called homosexuality. They came and criminalized that act. Today, when they are strengthening our judiciary, they tell us that that is no longer the case. That sex against the order of nature is now sex in accordance with new nature. That is Europe telling us. So as we strengthen our judiciaries, we must also ensure that we move towards giving them local flavor that addresses our specific circumstances. And as long as we don't do that, we'll have judiciaries that are alien in the manner in which they transact and in the manner in which they relate to the conflicts that emerge in the society. And I say this because increasingly now you are beginning to see that in addition to our judicial systems, we are beginning to talk about the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. And you see a lot of these, particularly in, uh, in West Africa, in Ghana, for example, when you come to conflicts around land, conflicts, uh, conflicts around the environment, you are beginning to find that the chief, the traditional rulers, are beginning to find a role in these areas. The question, therefore, when we talk about strengthening our judicial system, is it not necessary that we begin to mainstream some of our traditional dispute resolution mechanisms in terms of dispute resolution. In South Africa, there is an emerging jurisprudence in Africa today about what is called Ubuntu. Ubuntu simply means that you care about your neighbor. I'm putting it very simply, that what you do has an impact of your, on your neighbor, and you have a judicial system that restores rather than punishes because your typical inherited punishment methods are meant to be retributive rather than conciliatory. So when we talk about strengthening these particular institutions for purposes of ensuring peace and governance, time has come that we must now begin to look at our own systems and to unpack them. Nana Kobina Nketsia, the fifth is a Ghanaian traditional ruler and a lecture, former lecturer in political science. He's written a book that I want to commend to you and it will also form the basis of my conclusion. He says, culture and governance in Africa, the Ghanaian paradigm. And he says many things, but this is one of the things that he says that I identify with that given our training, most African countries forget that when we talk about culture, we are talking about the economy, we are talking about politics, we are talking about peace, we are talking about security. But we have been trained and made to believe that when you are talking about Africa, culture means dances which are performed by Africans. And you see that whenever you see a leader from a country arriving at an African airport, you never see it in Europe, there are no dancers. But when they arrive in an African airport, you'll see some people in a state of semi-nakedness dancing for those presidents, and we call that culture. 
We call that culture. I saw it even when the, the, the other day, the day before yesterday, when the Echoes were meeting about Mali and Burkina Faso. It was serious business. There were people drumming up in a state of half nakedness. I have no problem with it. But if you want to have a cultural day, have it. Culture means a lot more. And I'm now saying that as we strengthen our judicial system, let us begin to unpack culture and see how we can infuse it into our judicial system. Because, let me tell you, and I agree with Nana on this, as long as we keep on rethinking and doing the things that we do and we come before you in symposia after symposia, year after year, and regurgitating things that are alien to our reality, Africa will never know genuine peace. Africa will never know genuine security. Africa will never know sustainable development. Remember that conflict is a multi-billion dollar industry. Remember that African insecurity is a multi-dollar industry. Remember that poverty in Africa is a multi-billion dollar industry. And remember, therefore, that the sooner we realize that our institutions are necessary and those institutions must be authentic to our specific needs, then we will never know or realize the dividends of these. And I conclude by reminding us, the African state as we know it today is a state, many African states are different nations struggling to be states. In Nigeria, there are possibly over 250 nations struggling to make Nigeria. That in itself is a recipe for conflict. How do we mediate them? Do we mediate them on the basis of the laws that we inherited from the Belgians? In the Democratic Republic of Congo, there are over 230 nations struggling to make the Democratic Republic of Congo. Do we mediate the conflicts using Belgian law? In Tanzania, there are over 136 nations, the Europeans would prefer to call them tribes, nations trying to create something called the United Republic of Tanzania. Do we use laws that we inherited from the British in doing that? And in South Africa, and one can go on and on. So ladies and gentlemen, without belaboring the issue, I'm saying and suggesting to this audience that in order to begin to wrap our minds around many things, it is important that we in the African continent begin to ask certain very uncomfortable questions. Three years ago, a friend of mine from little Denmark, in his unguarded moment, told me, and I agree with him, that throughout history, no civilization has ever known real development in the language of another. Think about it. In the language of another. The Danes transact in the Danish language. There are only five million of them. The Norwegians, the same. The European Union has 27 languages. When each one of them is addressing the European Union, the Danes will speak Danish. The Norwegians will speak Norwegian. Oh, come to my mother continent. We are at our best when we are speaking French, when we are speaking English, when we are speaking Portuguese. Perhaps now that I hear Kiswahili is going to be the lingua franca, the next symposium will be talking about Amani, Utawala, na Usalama. I look forward to that day. God bless you.